theme everybody gets a theme I, I don't know I, I I actually started writing you another theme which was a 5-4 samba with a loop played by um, uh, Antonio Sanchez from Matheny's band and I just thought oh, it's, oh, it's, I don't know I, I checked out one of your things um, I've been listening to your solo CDs fairly intensively and I checked out a, a tune from a while back called Russia and that's what made me think of using oh, yeah. mine. and that's I transcribed it. I'm not sure I could play that thing, but um, I thought that was really interesting. I love that. And I, I tell you what That's I saw. It. You got it. That's exactly right. Oh, cool. I tell you what I saw. There's a video, which I'm sure you recall, of you rehearsing that with Manu Kache and Pino Palladino. Yeah. And Manu Kache is like tapping out the rhythm. Yeah. And it occurs to me that that particular tune sounds like one of those, not that it doesn't sound derivative any, or it, there's no real link, but it sounds a little bit along the lines of those Wayne Krantz things that sound like they're in odd times, but they're not really in odd times. It's just things spill over the bar and land at different places. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I don't know the uh, track you mean, but I, I, I really like Wayne Krantz. He's, he's a great guitar player. But I love all that whole idea of of uh, kind of illu of sonic illusions, you know, if, if you know what I mean. Uh, it's like a lot of times people ask me, is that in four, what, what time signature is that? And, and I love saying it's in 4-4. Four, four. Yeah. You know? Um, because a lot of the time, you know, there's a tune on one of the albums called Tizan, and nobody knows what's happening with that one. And all it is is that I come in on the uh, on on the second beat. Yeah, right. You know, it's like a and that's a kind of Bach trick. Right. It's like a mm, dun, 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 you know, it's like one dun dun dun. But you what? Oh, it's like Beethoven da 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 dum. You know, one da 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 dum. Yeah, yeah. Like it's a it's a half beat yeah but i I, re I love that whole idea of of something being in four four but and everyone thinks it's in something else and by the same token i love riffs that are actually in an odd time signature but they feel like they're in four four like money by pink floyd yeah or seven days yeah or seven days yeah i mean that's a that's one of the greatest grooves of all time i mean it's, that's i remember when that album came out everybody i knew was just destroyed by everybody i knew loved it it was trying to pick it apart it's the same kind yeah of well and Vinny, that's Vinny's genius you know like he he played it in such a way that it was very very easy to kind of take in right right i mean going back to your tune rush hour that video where manu Kacha is tapping out the rhythm back sort of backstage and peter pally neil stand there clocking it and i thought they're not they're not they're not inhuman enough to be clock be learning this in this context. That's not what was going on there, was it? That they were just you were just teaching it to them just like that because that's that's so yeah, pretty much. I mean, pretty much. I mean, I, I remember actually we used to have a band called the Tweeters years ago, which was uh, Pino, Manu, and myself. We, I think we did three gigs in our whole career, and that was one of the tunes we played. So, but we hadn't played it for like ten years, so that. They were kind of familiar with it, yeah. But I had to reteach it to them uh, about you know what the sections are and how we uh, navigate from one section to the other because that's the thing with arrangement is how do you get from section A to section B? Yeah, you know. Yeah, and that's I'm... all it was. That was that's all it was is just explaining it to them. You know. Wow. Well, I, that's I mean, from all of you guys, that's terrifying musicianship to be. You know, nailing something so complicated like that. 
Yeah, that, I thought that was a little bit frightening. I mean, yeah, you guys, I love all three of you guys. Some of my favorite players on any instrument. I'm a massive Pino fan. I, I could oh, just yeah. that guy play on his own all day. I just, I love it. But anyway, I thought that was knockout, that thing. And that, uh, checking out your more recent stuff, I think, did I see a video of your new song, Clandestine? Did yeah, I, yeah. Recent, and that was really interesting. Tell you what I loved about that. So I, I took down a sort of the germ of that idea. Where's it going here? And I, what I really liked about that, I'm probably in my doing it. What I was interested in was the harmony, like how you conceive of the harmony. And then also how you used the line at the top, the, the sort of um, the guitar, you know, the guitar part in the solo. I thought that was fascinating. So you go. You know, you, you, I mean, I know it's your yeah. tune. I know you know it. I'm not saying for the reason. I'm probably using rancid fingering, but. but um, I'm rushing it to get the chords. Okay. Oh, this is so slick. so slick back to the D major that's so slick the way you make that D major 7 haven't made the D major 7 with the sharp 5 but what I'm talking about you've got you play all that stuff and then for the piano solo I thought that was so slick to go the end of the intro bit and then you get that yeah for you to but that's also that's a, another example is that it's happening on a one two so it's like the, the 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 down the kick drum is is landing on the two right right see what i'm saying so it's yeah. an upside down groove yeah it's it's kind of it's not one of those things you think oh that just sounds awkward it, it sounds so natural and it flows so beautifully i thought what's going on here but the way that you put So I, I just love the way you've elongated the form of that and the guy soloing it. So here's a question. I've sort of I'm looking at my notes here, a question I was going to ask you. And in a lot of cases, it's about communication, really. I, I'm, I'm interested in how you communicate, not just with the guy's instincts, but but in, in your own music. So in organizing that stuff, is it? Did you give those guys charts, or was there just a bit of discussion and? you're off to the races. What I'm talking about is the layout of the tune, but also um, how you conceive of the actual harmony, you know, how you communicate what, what the guys have to play over. Well, the, the first thing I like to do is, is I mean, we spent a few days uh, rehearsing this album. Mm. Um, you know, because as you probably know, ECM albums are recorded in two days. Mm. Wow. It's two days, literally. I mean, and a couple of days mixing maximum. Yeah. And so what I, I they spent a few days in my house in the south of France, and I'm just basically showing them structures, what what the structures are, what the form of each tune is. And this this tune that you speak of, uh, clandestine, it, it definitely has a, a form, and the form is is what you just played correctly. Um, uh, you know, you picked it up exactly right. And so I'm just showing them that form. But then the next stage is when I'm like in that video, which they seem to have captured. I don't even remember there being a, a, a videographer, though. To, he must be a very good videographer because I have no memory of him being there. Yeah. And um, then what I try to do is I try to tell them what the story is, what the sort of musical narrative is. I mean, I don't have a story per se you know but it's called clandestine because it was during the lockdown that i used to go to this bar and hang out and we, we used to shut the windows you know even the owner was shutting them and sometimes the cops would go by and um everyone were hiding like school kid you know like high school kids you know behind you know in the in the alley back alley you know somewhere just so we don't get nicked <laughs> holding our drinks you know and um, smoking and all that sort of thing, everything illegal. 
So I wanted to have that, this feeling of um, a sort of a sinister vibe. So uh, that's why this, you know, that, that groove was saying that. That's where that comes from. So I'm trying to kind of tell a story. And so what I'm telling the guys is, this is the structure. And then I want you, Jacob, the pianist, who's like my striker on this album. Every album I do, I've got a striker. <laughs> I'm sort of I'm sort of midfield. I'm this sort of Eric Cantona of the band, you know. But I'm I I got to have guys who can do who can you know shine, because it's so it's important just to explain to the guys what the sort of form is. So we're going to go around one time just the the basic form. The second time we're going to go around you know like introducing a, a story you know like an improvisation, which is what Jacob did. And then I want the groove to come in. So then it slowly emerges the picture. So that's what I'm telling the guys. And I want a pedal bass. And I want the uh, the groove to be a sort of an upside down groove. Mm -hmm. So one, two, 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 one, two, 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 one, two. I mean, Manu Kache used to do that a lot. I, I always loved it when he did that. So really, that's all it is. And just going back to your earlier comment, it's like with Sting, I learned a lot. What I still continue to learn a lot from Sting, how to lead a band, right? You know, so and how to kind of get the musicians to to play at their best. This so is what important. are the specifics of that then? I mean, specifically, what kind of thing do you mean then? What I mean is um, one thing that Sting, his philosophy with. Uh, musos in a band mm. session players mm. which is what i am with to him um uh, is is to make them shine allow them to to be themselves yeah but within the the, the strict confines of of what the structure and the narrative is yeah so it's quite strict and yeah. you remember he was a school teacher and all that you know so it is quite um it's it's quite academic in a way, but it's fun. I want it to be fun. So his philosophy is the better they look, the better I look. So I totally get that, you know, so the better that they jam and solo and, and I don't think of it, we don't think of it as soloing in my band, you know, it's more like playing. Mm -hmm. It's not like, okay, you're gonna do a chorus two times around and then you do a solo. It's not really like that. It's like, well, they weren't really organized that way. It's, it, I would say, Jacob, I want you to just do some kind of improvisation here and for this section. And if that can be interpreted as, as a solo, well, then that's up to the listener to decide. Mm -hmm. But it's not the way I see it. But that's all it is, is you know, so what do I learn from Sting? It's, it's exactly that, is how to get the musicians to play at their best, which is what a sort of a mid, using the football analogy, it always comes down to it, is, is what a midfield player would do. Is is like feed the uh, the ball right. to to the right place, and then is a, there's that whole thing of sometimes is is when when do you use space, when do you not play, mm. and that's so important as well. It's like because light and shade and and content and no content or ma or you know mass content, you know like sometimes you just got to just chill. Mm. because when you do that you're actually allowing something else to, to come up to yeah. reveal itself mm. and you know these are little tricks that i've learned from sting is like taciting when to tacit why to tacit yeah how does that help the uh, the story yeah and with it, with his music it's, in a way it's easier because we're dealing with lyrics mm. you know but this here we're dealing with instrumental music and so i'm trying to tell a story and yeah. it's so important to use, uh, what I do is I use those Sting's kind of chops of storytelling, but in instrumental music. Yeah. And, you know, I've learned from a lot of great singer-songwriters, you know, like, um, uh, you, you've probably seen hundreds of people that I've played with and stuff, but every time I walk out of one of those sessions, I go, wow, the way that that artist dealt with, with his producer, because mm. there's also the, the producer side to it as well. Yeah, you know how do they, how do they get to the, the place that they need to be, 
instead of just jamming and showing how good you are as a player. And, you know, that's fine. Everybody can play. You've got the gig. You know, you, you don't need to prove yourself anymore. Yeah. So you just need to just step back. And, and um, that's what I like to do with my musicians is, is like Sting, is just let them shine. But I don't want anybody to draw too much attention to themselves, you know, because yeah. then it becomes like, oh, did you hear that solo on such and such an album? I don't want people to say that. About, yeah. about any of my tunes i want them to say did you hear that tune you know and yeah. i love what he played you know though that section there was great but it's it's not about individual uh achievement and it's not even about my achievement i'm just the, the storyteller and it's almost like i'm so i'm ranting now but just oh, to not finish, I, I feel like uh it's almost like theater and i i, I go to a, a, i live in paris I don't go to that many gigs, but I like going to theater and right. sometimes even French theater. Right. You know, because I love watching actors work together with a theme, especially if they're improvising. Mm. And so each one of these tunes on Vagabond or on all my albums is sort of like a, a play. And each tune is a scene from that play. Yeah. And if I approach it that way, it's much easier to tell the story. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, um, you know, it's like the actors from, um, you know, the, the the acting company that did Spinal Tap, you know, yeah. and they did Waiting for Guffman, they did Best in Show. They're all improvising. Those it's sort of a guest on those guys. Yeah. yeah, but they've got themes that they're working on. And it, it's so beautifully done, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Best in Show. But they're really mm -hmm. good actors and they can play any role. And so I love to have people in my band who I tell them, can you play, just mimic something country here or something bossa nova there or sort of pseudo classical? They totally get it, what yeah. I mean. Yeah. And Sting would do that to me. He said, Dom, play some country here. I don't really like country, but I know what he means. Yeah. So I can kind of put myself in that character. Yeah. So we are character actors. And that's how I get my band to play the way that they do, mm. the same way that Sting does. It's like I'm sort of trying to tell a story and not just trying to show a muso kind of, uh, it's not an exhibition of musicianship necessarily, but if people want to perceive it that way, I'm really chuffed that if they do, yeah. because undoubtedly I've got killer musicians, you know, yeah. uh, working with me. And of course that helps a lot. People with a broad palette, you know, like a lot of, they uh, have a lot of colors. And to finish off, the number one superpower that they all have in common is instinct. Mm. So all our plays, that little do 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 I want their instinct on what does that mean to you? Yeah. How do you, what would you do with that? Yeah. And I'm just giving you this. Yeah. I'm, ha I'm uh, throwing the ball across the net. It's like, what, what do you think? throw back at me you know what i mean yeah absolutely What's your yeah. take on that yeah, yeah. And it's like what miles used to do mm. you know the that's i mean the bar is set very high with miles but i love i love miles davis's uh, philosophy of band leading whereas a lot of the time he was just hanging by the side of the stage yeah yeah you know i mean this is very interesting the way the way you describe the way you organize it there's a there's a there's a kind of spirit to those albums of yours. I think they've all got this thing where it makes me think of some stuff that you and Sting said in that great interview you guys did with Rick Beato a while back. Um, and where he, I mean, you're talking about the, the teams, the team player thing, but you, you seem so relaxed, but secure in what you're doing. You're not, you don't seem desperate to show off what you've, you've, you've said as much in other interviews. You're not desperate to show off chops on the guitar but another thing that i i noticed in it whilst it is harmonically complex music and rhythmically complex and the form can be complex it's kind of you you're not throwing all your tricks in there harmonically either but it's really deep harmonically there's no it's almost like um if you were a film director they'd say you were an auteur you know somebody who has such a uh, an individual style and 
a real character to what they do rather than somebody just had technical only the technical knowledge you know which would which would make them sort of a cop a copy of other people's work this this album just this new album just you you take your time with things it's just you when as a listener it seemed to me that i just couldn't wait to see where things went and i thought this is just going to take as long as it takes to go wherever the hell it goes and it's got that hypnotic vibe and it, it's i don't think it's an accident that it's an ecm thing other it made me think of those early Matheny albums um you know even up to as far as 80 81 it made me think of the the sound of those things Matheny sort of lets things unfold at his own yeah. point. It's, it's that shows a, a, an uncommon level of confidence really and and direction well, I've, learned a lot. I've learned a lot I've learned a lot doing uh, since I've been doing albums with ECM. I think this is this is my third one. Right. I've actually obviously learned a lot from Manfred, and it's interesting that you use the uh, film director kind of uh, analogy because uh, that's exactly how I see it with Manfred. Is that it's almost like if you came with a, a story or a, a tune or a, a concept. You could either, if you went to Spielberg, it would come out one way. But if you went to Polanski or Hitchcock, it would mm. come out a completely different way. Yeah, and that's sort of more what Manfred does is, as a as a musician and as a composer, I'm putting myself in a in his realm, and it's a it's a pretty intense place to be because, on one hand, I feel quite insecure the way that Polanski or Hitchcock might feel, make an actor feel. Right. I, I feel, I feel unconfident. Really? You know? that's, a, yeah. that's amazing to me. Okay. But at the same time, I feel quite empowered by virtue of the fact that I'm actually there in the first place. And he called me. Yeah. And he, he set this, this situation up. He's the architect of this situation that we're in. And that's always in the back of my mind yeah. while I'm feeling insecure. Because he's listening to what I've got. Because he was usually sort of says, okay, so what's the first tune going to be? And so we'll play it. And then he'll just go, you guys need to uh, lighten up. Just forget everything you know. This is not, it's, it sounds too organized. Just let, you know, you've got to be more free with it. Because yeah. that's what he loves. So, you know, it's it's that just can throw you as a musician. You've worked on something for six weeks, and uh, suddenly the producers sort of going, "Eh, you know, it's good. I like it's charming, but I think you can do better." Right. So, you know, it's not for everybody. This uh, ECM situation. I know a lot of people who would dream on being on on a label like that. I did for years. Yeah. But it's not until I was actually in that situation that I realized what it actually meant. Yeah. Right. And it's like. It's not for it's not for sissies, because you are your shit is going to be unravelled, yeah, and you're going to be shown for who you are. It's almost like a photographer is going to take pictures of you, and he's going to show you the pictures that he wants to submit, and you, and you're not going to like them because you're going to not going to like the angle of your nose and or your forehead or your hair is wrong. This is not the the photograph that you would submit of yourself and but it is a better depiction of who you are right it's actually a true depiction of who you are and you know i'm now li li listening back to old Esberto gismonti albums or ralph towner albums yeah, yeah. or john abcrombie mm. ecm albums yeah. or, and i now understand why i was so seduced by them and that's because they were imperfect and kind of uh, there was something charming about that uh, vulnerability that comes out in the articulation of Esberto struggling with a, a high melody on a guitar or on a piano. There's a couple of double notes being played. And I'm thinking, wow, that's on the fucking record. <laughs> Good. Whereas if you if you left to your own devices, what you end up with, if I were to produce my own album, as I've done a few times, what you end up with is a selfie. Now, 
which is actually a mirror image. Yeah. You know, is, is a selfie the best depiction of who you are? I don't think so. No. You know, so this is what ho uh, self-produced albums actually really are. Yeah. Especially with technology the way we have it now is, oh, I rushed that. So easy to fix it. But if you rush something or misarticulate a note with Manfred Eiffel in the room, he ain't going to let you fix it. He's going to, you're going to go, hey, I, I, I've said many times, Manfred, you can hear I'm playing an F sharp there where it should be an F. He says, I, I can hear that. And I said, well, we, we're going to drop in, aren't we? He's going to go, no, you're not. That's what you play. And not only that, he's going to fucking turn it up. Oh, you know, that's a, probably an exaggeration, but you know what I mean? It's, it's That's the sort of direction he's going because he wants that photograph. Yeah, yeah. He wants that take from an actor. And there are there only going to be two takes. Wow. Wow. So it's like it's all like, almost like Woody Allen making a movie with Kate Blanchett. You know, everybody wants to work with Woody Allen or uh, or Polanski or back in the day it would have been Hitchcock. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. Because they th those people get the, a performance out of them that they couldn't get with anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it's a great uh, union working with that label. And I have to give a lot of credit to Manfred. And the whole concept of the label for allowing me to reach the level that I did on, on the last three albums, yeah. which is it's kind of uh, probably more authentic than previous albums. Well, it's a different style, isn't it? It's a different, sonically, it's different. I tell you what, I mean, it, this is fascinating because you listen to those albums and you could be forgiven for thinking that you guys slaved over them. It's like taking days to get the tone of things. One thing, what was that? Let me just look at my notes here. One, one of the tones on, on that. Um, um, yeah, I'm thinking of a tune called Cruel But Fair. Oh, yeah. The, the nylon string tone. I remember being amazed once. I went into shop for a very, well, for my level, a very posh um, classical guitar. And I ended up buying a Conde Omanos uh, flamenco. But I remember the guys at Ivor Morant's music center, you know, that shop in London, saying, well, you know, the greatest classical guitar tone, Pat Metheny. I thought, what? I mean, I think, you know, there. I mean, Pat Metheny is one of my favorite musicians. I've even yeah. written, written a book of transcriptions of Metheny. He's one of, I've spent many thousands of hours talking mm. to Metheny. So this is no diss for him, and it is an amazing sound. But that blew my mind that somebody who was selling top, top of the line classical guitars was saying, Check out Pat Metheny's tone. As beautiful as it is, it's a particular thing. But that's such a heavy tone that he's got. Yeah. Whilst this might not be the most authentic classical tone, that's one of the deepest guitar tones I've ever heard, Metheny's nylon string tone. And your tone on that tune made me think, that's one of the best recorded nylon string sounds I've ever heard. It. It's the note production, obviously, but the way it's represented is absolutely killer. So were there any particular tricks in recording it did he did you know not at all really no no just to, i just had the mics in front of me and you know the thing with mics yeah obviously they're good mics i don't even know what they were i don't i let engineers do their thing you know what i mean but the thing with mics is a, a good engineer is not going to stand in front of you and go like exactly where is your sound or how are you playing a good engineer is just going to let you find the sound you know that's what Ian Eric did in, in Oslo when I recorded in Rainbow, which is actually where Pat Metheny recorded a few albums in, right, in, right. in Oslo. Yeah. But uh, with uh, Gerard de Haro, who recorded me in, um, in France, he recorded all of us. He just put the mics in front of me. But it's like when you put the cans on, it's like you find the sound. Yeah, you right. know where you should be. Right. So I will, you know, just by moving the, just the slightest amount, mm. you find it. Yeah, you know what I mean, or just yeah. come in to the um, to the mics a bit. And that I had a similar experience when I worked with Mark Hollis from uh, Talk Talk years ago. It's the same thing. It's a uh, he did an album. I'm not going to go on about it too much, but he did an album where he just had two mics. Uh, I can't Neumanns, I think, that were like this, and he wanted everybody who was overdubbing to would just work on those two mics with the same level on the desk and your level would be determined by your proximity to the mic 
And so I remember being so close to the mic that I was almost touching it. Right. But this is, I learned a lot from that session. So mic, a microphone is almost like an audience. It's like, it's like your muse. Mm. You're, you're offering this to the microphone. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a type of projection. That's why a great opera singer you know, they don't need to do very much to to make the needles flap about. You know, you could put a, a, the, the mic very, very far away and um, they, they know about projection. And I yeah. think it's just projection. Yeah, It's being aware of a microphone being there. It's not just like the engineer is going to make me sound great. You've got to work with the mic. Yeah. Like it's a collaboration. Yeah. I take it seriously. You know what I mean? Oh, sure. So it like if, it, yeah. if, I, if I want the guitar to sound a little bit deeper or brighter i might just move slightly right you know that's all it is and also with the nylon you talk about nylon I mean, you know pamethony does have a great nylon sound i think and my favorite nylon players are the ones who play without nails it's because i don't use nails it's a, it's a flesh sound right okay so it's there's the classical sound which is actually it's only been around for like 50 or 60 years that people did use nails right. it's just to get it's just for volume really yeah. so you could play in the wigmore hall and people would hear you you know what i mean yeah. but the the traditional way of playing is without nails which is how lute players play a gut string is is without nails yeah right a, yeah. a really good lute player would do it that way someone who only plays lute because yeah. a lot of lute players also play classical guitar, yeah. but the best lute players are the exclusive lute players. They just well, play a, a different grip, isn't there? With the and it's a different grip. It's a different uh, technique. It's not apoyando technique, which is going into the string. Mm. A lute is more like plucking. It's 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 like a bow and arrow, you know. Yeah, right. It's pulling. Yeah, yeah. It's a totally different technique. It's like yeah. it's pulling. Yeah. Whereas classical technique is more digging in. Yeah, a good, a good Restful. classical. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, there's no trick to that sound. It's, I use good guitars, and you know, but sound is is the most important thing to me. And I, that's what, if I work on anything, it's that is uh, is getting a good sound. I can spend hours just playing slowly, and you know, on the first album I did for ECM, the, the, I spent a long time just uh, with that first tune what you didn't say is the opening track on the album, just hours just trying to get that sound before I went into the studio. And then I, when I felt I got it and Manfred heard it and Jan Eric heard it, they thought they totally got what I was about because yeah. that I'm just into the sound. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really quite profound. I'm going to really meditate on that, really sort of working with the mic that way. So go in your, actually, I suppose it relates to all of your electric guitar playing. So that process you're talking about there with working with the mic, sort of orienting yourself so that you get the optimum out of it. Are you one of those guys who spent spends ages with mic placement? Or again, is it the same story? You just trust those guys and Yeah. No, not at all. No, I don't I don't spend time with that at all. And also I tr I trust the engineer. You yeah. have to trust an engineer. If you're gonna go in a studio, it doesn't matter which studio it is. Yeah. Whoever the engineer is, you let them do their job. You do your job. Yeah. And um, but I don't have any uh, preference of microphones, and um, you know I'll tell you a quick story about Jan Eric. You know he's the, the legendary engineer who did all the ECM albums. Mm -hmm. You know he did a lot of stuff with Pat Metheny. Yeah, is uh, when I went to the fir my first session with ECM in Oslo, I remember just uh, getting to the studio, and I kind of I had my coat on and I wanted to just warm up, so I went to one corner of the room. And I was just, you know, practicing just to warm up. And you know, Miles Bowl, the percussionist, he was setting up on the in the corner somewhere. I'm just warming up. On, I found a chair and I just sat down. And then Jan Eric went into the cupboard, brought out two mic stands, and he went plunk like that right in front of me. And I thought, what are you doing? He said, this is where you're going to go. Which was, and the control room was behind me. And I'm thinking, surely there's some kind of candle lighting ceremony and we're all going to kind of chant or something before i do this amazing first take and he says no here are the mics here's the cans there's the level here's the talk back and then he went off and i, and I didn't know what to do <laughs> you know what i mean 
Yeah. It taught me a great lesson there. Yeah. Because what he did there is he gave me, he empowered me to, he really involved me in the session. Yeah. Because I really thought that I, I didn't know what to expect. I thought there would be some kind of ceremonial process. Yeah. And that's you know, where everybody goes. There's a lot of engineers are like that. They mm -hmm. go, who oh, I always use this mic on that bass drum, or I, you know, I use these overheads, it always sounds good on, on any kit. But that's not how these people work. Yeah. It's a very feng shui kind of situation that I was put into. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, this is where the guy he feels that I should be sitting right here, right now. And this is where I'm recording with my back to the control room. Yeah. Or at an angle, not facing it or gloriously facing it with, you know, incense around me. <laughs> well, that's, a wild, no, that's a great interpretation. You said you, that's the, you took the most empowering interpretation of that situation. That's really interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah, I Rather than thinking, oh, this is a roast and feeling uh, just going with uh, being intimidated. I mean, that's that's a brilliant interpretation. Well, great. That's but just, then there was the in that studio because my my guitars didn't turn up because I, I used uh dpd whatever the shipping company uh, of yeah. to ship my guitars they didn't arrive they got stuck in customs so right. i only had the one nylon guitar but all my other ones the steel string ones they didn't show up so i used the guitar that was in the studio for the steel string tunes right which is some dodgy old ibanez like it's like the studio cat, you know, <laughs> it was just sitting there. And that was Jan Eric's guitar. Like every studio has got a guitar lying around somewhere and a keyboard and a, and a horrible bright red bass, probably, yeah, you know, drum kit. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so I used that guitar. And um, it sounded quite good. It's a but Jan told me that was the guitar. So I used that on a few other tunes, one tune called Angel and um, a couple of others and en passant and then but i remember this is a, a cool story talking about pat Metheny. then the album came out and then i got an email through my uh, manager from pat Metheny because he's and pat Metheny writes me an email say uh dear dominic i've got i hope it's this is the right address for you i saw an interview you did you where you were talking about that dodgy guitar I used that guitar on 81, 82 because I, oh. I didn't have my guitar. I used that same guitar. And I'm going, whoa, what? no way. And then he said to me, by the way, I really like your album. Nice touch. And I thought, wow. And you can imagine, I've got an email from Pat Metheny. So like, how do I, what do I do? I've got to print this. I'm going to yeah, frame yeah. it. How do you frame a, uh, an email and put it on you know that's this is mantelpiece material oh you need a tattoo it's got to be a tattoo this is serious <laughs> yeah. business and of course all my guitar nerd mates were in on the, this email i did a snap a screenshot of it and i sent yeah. it to of course i sent it to my mates sure, who yeah. were well chuffed i would have sent it to you if i had your address <laughs> you know what i mean but all my guitar mates i've sent it to everybody i know and so that's that's my pat Metheny story is uh he sent me a really really touching email saying that that he really liked the album, he likes the touch, mm. and that he used that same guitar that I used um, on 81, 82, yeah. whatever the album's called. 80, 81, yeah. 80, 81. That's a brilliant, I mean, it's that's kind of a freewheeling kind of thing with um, Dewey Redman on sax, Charlie Hayden, Jack DeJohnette, I think. It's, yeah. it's a flowing kind of album. They play a couple of Ornette Coleman things, but oh man, that's... Yeah, Nett's drums were in the studio as well. Oh, wow. He left his drum, his drum kit there, and my percussionist used those drums for one track. So you can imagine him; he's totally freaking out. Lovely. He's playing on Dijonet's drums, which he left in that because he did so many sessions for ECM yeah. that he left a kit there. Yeah, because he was always ending up on their records. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he left a kit in Rainbow Studios. Wow. This is history. I mean, it, you just made me think. I saw a video um, on YouTube of Pat Metheny sitting in with you on, I think it was Shape of My Heart, some yeah. Montreal Jazz Festival or something. You guys should really play together. And it also made me think as well, I tell you what I'd love to hear is you play with Bill Frizzell. That would be really Oh, yeah. Awesome. I'm a big fan. He's a huge influence on me, actually. I didn't really know, you know, because 
I've heard Bill Frizzell for years, but I didn't know who it was or, or what it was. Yeah. A lot of those, you know, Eb, Ebhardt Weber albums and there's a lot of the, you know, a lot of those uh, uh, 70s and 80s ECM albums, you know, um, Jan Garbarek, there's, what is that sound? There's a sort of sound on each track. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And now I know, it, it, is it a synth? Is it a pedal steel? No, it's Bill Frizzell with a Telecaster, but he had a, he has a, he's the only guitarist I know who's, I can say, he's got, he's a real artist with intonation. Right, that's interesting. Wow. He play he what he plays with intonation. And I think he does stuff with the neck. Maybe he mm. you know, he's on a telecaster a lot of the time, I think. These days, yeah. Yeah. And uh I don't know what he was playing then, but there's something about his intonation. He was using a when Klein he articulates guitar back in the day. Sorry? He was using a Klein guitar. Like oh really? Or workshop guitar, yeah. I love the way he intonates, you know, because a lot of the time he does that thing that Larry Carlton does, it's like two note chords. Mm. Oh. And a lot of cluster type of course, you know, with second harmonies or, you know, like very tight harmonies, which yeah. Larry Carlton does too. Yeah. Which I really like not playing the root and not playing the melody. So he just finds those two notes in the middle of the the uh, story or the, the, the structure or the harmony. Yeah. He'll find the notes that complement the melody and the bass. Yeah. And his his sense of uh, placement he's a fucking genius oh absolutely yeah. the guy i yeah. love him i'm a huge fan so i'm influenced by him especially the way i play with sting on electric yeah he's, uh, I, I do i use a lot of those type of techniques my my biggest influences on electric are probably him and john mclaughlin the way he kind of he uh uh arpeggiates you know um uh, his type his type of arpeggiation it, the way yeah. The shape of his arpeggios. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, I hear that in what you do. I definitely, definitely would have would have discerned that. It just, and just that thought, like the arpeggio with... things in a Marvishan orchestra. A few of your things, I thought he must he must be. Oh, definitely, yeah. That mixed with uh, the arpeggios, I love the way that uh, the Pretenders and Chrissy Hine, her guitar player, always, or the Birds, you know, that sort of yeah. American jangly, or or. or Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, that type of guitar playing, you know, yeah. that type of arpeggio, arpeggio as well yeah. comes into it too. Yeah. yeah. So you mix that sort of Americana rock and roll, uh, elegant rock and roll, which I think you can call the Heartbreakers, mixed with John McLaughlin's sort of jazz rock. It's fusion. Yeah. Fusion, true fusion. You know, it yeah. really was good fusion. And uh, it's that's like, thank you. So I kind of, I, I, that came into my DNA. That is part of my DNA, is those guys. Yeah. Mixed with Bill Frizzell's sort of ghostly sort of notes. And if you listen to the Soul Cages album, I'm doing a lot of that, a lot of panoramic type of uh, um single note or double note type of uh, stuff and like Bill Frizzell would. But I didn't know that he was my influence then. I didn't even know who Bill Frizzell was then, but I knew the sound that I wanted to get. And now I know that that's the, that it was him because a lot of those early Eberhard Weber albums and uh, he's on them yeah. and it was him playing. I didn't know who it was. Yeah. Yeah. There's a I want, I'll send you a link to this later. There's a great, interview with Bill Frizzell. It's a, I think it's Kent State University in the States. And the guy who must be the head of music or something does an interview with him. And he does these reharms of tunes like Shenandoah and a couple of like When You Wish Upon a Car or something. And I tell you what's fascinating with him. And it really it, I, I could really hear that link between you and him. That's why I'm saying it to you. I, I think you might like it. I'll send you the link later. Please do. He kind of reinvents Shenandoah. He starts playing it like three chords. And then he said, well, now I'm going to try a bit more stuff. And it's like, oh, man, it's so in the moment. So I'll send it to you anyway, because it's right up your street. And yeah. I could definitely. And, and the Soul Cages is the album I've been listening to that made me think, oh, that's there's got to be that sort of influence there, really. Um, here's a question, then, just from my notes here. In terms of doing when you work live, have you seen any great advances in 
the way that uh, nylon strings or acoustics in general are amplified. Have you come across any great solutions for ampl amplifying a great acoustic guitar rather than just, you know, your standard of electric? No, I mean, uh, it depends if you're doing a big show or a club show. Right. For a club show, I would use the guitars that I use, which are, are, are real guitars mm. with a PA, uh, just a, a, a Fishman pickup. Yeah. I think the Fishman pickup under the bridge is the, is the only solution right. instead of a microphone in the guitar. But yeah. for a big sting type show where, where there's, there's, a, there's side fills and a big PA, I've got to have a solid body. Oh, okay. Right. Just to stop the uh, out of control feedback. And I'm not putting one of those little things on the sound hole because yeah. then you lose the sound of the guitar. What's the point? Might yeah. as well get solid body, you know? So. Yeah. I don't think there's any real answer to that. I think a lot of it is down to touch, you know. Yeah. It, it, it's the thing with the touch. Are you going to use a pick or are you going to use your hands, your fingers? Yeah. yeah. You know, this is the other thing too. And if you're standing up, it's you, it's very difficult to get a good technique going as opposed to if you're sitting down where you can lean on the... You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there's yeah. There's a lot sure. of variables. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. are there any advances? No, there's no real advances. I think... Um, it's quite difficult to to amplify a, or DI a nylon string guitar. And the only solution is what you do with your right hand is how you articulate the notes. Right. And that's here. Now we're going back to nails versus not not nails. Yeah. I would say definitely not nails if you're going to or else it's just going to sound scratchy. Yeah. It's very rare that a, a nylon string guitar is going to sound good with a pick DI'd. Whereas yeah. a steel string acoustic does for some reason. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I just do with what I've got, you know what I mean? But for a, a with my band, for instance, if I'm touring with my band, I'll take my normal guitar with me, plug in, it's fine. And I have, you know, I'll tell you a good secret for playing nylon is don't have yourself in the monitor. Wow. Okay. Or if you are going to use monitors, Put them like Paco de Lucia did. He's a clever, clever guy. He never had them. It's always traditional to have them right in front of you. Have two or one. Yeah. If you're going to have monitors, actually probably have them behind you. Right. So they act as a, act as a PA as well. Or yeah. just, or to the side of you. Yeah, right. Um, or else you are going to have problems with the uh, feedback. And, yeah. and, in, and uh, overtones are not going to come out the same way. Yeah. You know, because depending on the, the sound, the overtones are going to be picked up in a different way. So you yeah. don't want any interference with your own overtones. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if it's very middly, the sound, it's just going to pick up all the middle frequencies. So that's a whole other game, isn't it? I always find if you're doing a small gig and there's a bass player right next, I always feel that's just robbing the middle of my sonic sort of spectrum. I, always I know what you mean. The other it's... side of the drums from a bass player. You yeah, but then the other thing is that people, some people are in ears and some people are not. Yeah. So then yeah. if you're in ears, well, then everything's much easier. But I'm I'm not part of that movement. But, the, you know, a top tip for yeah. playing nylon string on a gig is have your, if you are going to have monitors, have yourself very, very low in the mix. Right. And then just, you can hear yourself in the PA if you're in the PA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you've got something to say, that's good trust your sound man to deal with it and yeah. if you are playing anything that's reasonable he's going to put you in the fucking pa <laughs> you know you know what i mean yeah if it's yeah. a local guy because you know let's face it when i do touring with my band sometimes i use the local guy yeah. which is very smart because if you take your own guy to a club the problem with some clubs is they've got a lot of weird pockets in the rooms where they're you, you have you lose a lot of bass frequency or you have too much top frequency they know their room yeah right you know what i mean yeah if absolutely. you bring your own guy he's just going to come with his desk and his setup it yeah. doesn't mean anything that you know because it's it's very it's it's a science sound you know what i mean so if yeah. you're doing good stuff and he doesn't know your set he doesn't know you yeah he sees you're on the bill but he's he's going to put you in the PA when he thinks that you're doing something good yeah. and then it's, it, there's that whole thing of trust trusting the process and when you trust a sound man and when you trust the sound out front when you don't have yourself very high in the monitors 
Yeah. If you if you know you're in tune, you've got your shit together. A lot of the time I can't hear myself very well, but I know I'm playing precisely and correctly and I'm trusting the sound man. Yeah. yeah. And I know that the drummer can hear me because it's my band and he needs me in his monitor. Yeah. So yeah. he's doing the right thing and it's really down to trust. Yeah. Gigs are chaotic. I mean, not to mention if you're doing a TV date or something like if you're doing a telly or a radio thing, then you've got to be if that really separates the men from the boys when it comes down to like how how well can you perform this tune because it's guaranteed that you're not going to have a great sound when you're dealing with bbc or itv or you know you know no yeah. disrespect sure, yeah. but you know a lot of these people they don't have the right reverb they don't have the right eq they might put too much compre never put compression on a nylon string guitar right. ever right that's a big no no right steel string yes it yeah. would a little bit, but yeah. don't do it on a nylon, or it's going to go totally out of control. Right, interesting. But I'm not a big sound guy, you know. Uh, I don't really know much about sound, but I know a lot about trusting uh, people and the benefits of trusting people. That's and really profound. That really resonates for me. I, I'm going to definitely meditate on that too. That's that's a big part of what you're saying, and then you're sort of trusting yourself, but you're trusting other people. You're empowering them. The yeah. way, same way that yeah. Yeah, Eric empowered me. It's mm -hmm. like, dude, this is what you do. This is what I do. Let's yeah. do it together. Let's let's win. Yeah. You know what I mean? Instead of yeah. having, because not to say that I don't have wobblers and sound checks. You know, a sound check is the time for a, you know, sometimes I go, what the fuck? You know, that's too much. There's too much. Like, what are you doing? Too much reverb. Yeah, Turn yeah. it down. I don't want reverb in the monitor. I don't want this. I, you know, and I can lose it. But that's, part of the the process it's like you know a great chef in a kitchen you know will scream and shout but the end result is really good they're they're known for that even film directors are known for fucking losing their bottle <laughs> and i do sometimes but when it comes to showtime let's work together yeah right. we're gonna have a great performance yeah yeah there's one thing i saw i don't know why i can't how i came across it particularly saw so you playing slide and it was uh what's his name that guy who writes film music was on the second guitar lyle workman was on it oh it yeah rhythm to you and you were taking yeah. a solo on slide that made me think I've, I've never never really thought about your slide playing before you know when you play slide do you use compression are you doing that yeah. thing or do you just play you know yeah yeah on electric i would use compression but definitely i mean i mean my favorite slide player is george harrison well, that's interesting. Yeah, right. And, you know, then you have Bonnie Raitt and, um, well, of course, uh, Rory Gallagher. Um, yeah. But I love the way these Nashville guys do it. I mean, it's a, it's a, an effect, you know. Of course, you need a bit of compression uh, it, if you want it to, to work well. I heard it had a really top tip about slide playing from Waddy Wachtel. Oh, yeah. He's a, uh, a, a guitar player in America who played with Keith Richards' band. I did a, back in the 90s where I used to do sessions all the time. Oh. I ended up in on a session with Wadi Wattel. I can't remember who the artist was. Oh, it'll come to me. So but he was, so there were, it was a two guitar deal. So I've got Wadi Wattel there. I'm thinking, wow, I'm going to learn from this guy. I want to see what he's got. And apart from having a 1958 Les Paul, which was obviously beautiful the thing about Wadi Wattel is he's a very precise player he's a really seasoned session player yeah like Americans are very good at session playing I've learned so much from these guys mm -hmm. but he told me about slide playing the secret to slide, slide playing is is don't try to just kind of vibe it and it's going to come to you use your eyes right yeah you got your dots on your guitar you got your frets, you know, you, at least you've got dots, yeah. you know, precision is the thing, because if you're slightly off, it's going to, it's going to show. And then the engineer is not going to, or the mixing engineer is not going to want to hear it. Yeah. Nobody's going to want to hear it or some, if it's not a good mixing engineer, they're not going to understand what's wrong with the track. Yeah. But intonation is absolutely the key right. with slide playing. Yeah. So, have you got the bottle <laughs> to to nail this this little moment? If as soon as you put it on your finger, are you sure that you can play in tune, or else just leave it where it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what he showed me that on a Les Paul, 
how he dealt with style. And he was so precise. Thought, yeah. Wow, that's the key. Yeah, right. To so play in tune, don't just have be wandering off and, you know, cloud your own sort of planet. Yeah. Just focus. Yeah. That's the, the if there's any time that you need to focus on your guitar playing, it's when it's when you're playing slide. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, particularly if, you, if your mix isn't great, if you're not hearing the bass, the bottom of the harmony. And not right to there. mention your right hand articulation. Right. It is very complicated playing slide. Is what what you're doing with your right hand. Yeah. If, when you watch a slide player, you should really be watching what they're doing with their right hand more than their left hand. Yeah. Because that's yeah. that's just information. That's just data. Yeah. <laughs> what they're doing here is very very complex. Yeah. I wonder how many people. I, I wonder if this resonates for you. I wonder how many people are that deliberate about muting. Well, it's all muting. But it's in this, do you find it? It's it's yeah. It's all muting, but it's also instinctive. Don't you think? That you absolutely. think absolutely, it's absolutely you think instinctive. It? Yeah, it is instinctive. Yeah, which is what right hand playing is is uh, anyway. I mean, good so. rhythm players. Yeah, you know my favorite rhythm players. It might surprise you to know who my favorite guitar rhythm players are. You know, it's like well Eddie Van Halen. Right. Great, incredible groove. Yeah. Oh God. I mean, I, I love the way he solos and stuff, but I mean, I'm much more interested in how he puts down a riff. Yeah. But it, uh, but it's his right hand. The right hand is is like everything, and it's it is instinctive. Yeah. For yeah. everybody, you know, you learn a lot from. I mean, talk about right hand. You got Mark Knopfler. You got Jeff Beck. I mean, we could ke we could just talk for hours about what is possible with the right hand because that's that's the bow of the violin yeah that's how you get the sound is coming from your right hand yeah not from your left hand yeah. unless you're a shredder yeah which is I'm, I'm a big fan of a lot of these guys i mean believe me i really really am yeah. it's not the way that i've gone as a musician or a guitarist you know I just haven't put in the hours to be able to shred like that. You know, I've, I've got six kids and two dogs, you know, <laughs> but I wish I could play like that. I just, I just can't. I'm sure you could, if you applied yourself to that kind of thinking, you know, I'm sure you could, but yeah, it's not, it's not your thing, whatever. I tell you what I'm interested in rewinding a bit. I guess this relates, there are two names I'm seeing on different questions here. My first thing is how did he reeling back? God bless him. How did you interface with Kenny Kirkland? In oh my God! Did you talk? Did you guys talk about harmonic specifics or approaches, or did everybody just go about their business and you just get the job done? Oh man! You, I mean, I'm really glad you mentioned him. He was he was the he was a great teacher to me in in many many ways. I mean, his sense of harmony. It, it, it's his left hand on the piano. The way he uh, harmonized. His interpretation of, of of any chord sequence was it just fascinated me. His voicings, mm. voicings, voicings, voicings. Yeah, yeah. How he articulated, what he, how he complemented a melody. Great musician. Oh yeah. And I did. It's not so. He, I didn't sit down with him and ask him why did. You, how are you choosing this chord, that chord? I don't do that. You know. It's more like it's a life lesson, you know. It's, any great guru is not going to tell you the details. Yeah, right. You know, right. He never told me the details. I learned them by watching him. Yeah, right. Yeah. There's another place for that. You know, it's funny because one time I was on a plane, I was in a, a, a on tour, and I was in Oslo Airport, and I found myself in the business lounge, and Steve Lukather was there. And I've, of course, I've met him and I sort of know him. He knows me. And, you know, it's a sort of community. We've bumped into each other a few times. But then he, he said, oh, I'm flying on to um, Stockholm. And I'm going, oh, so am I. So we're both flying to the same place. And then we ended up sitting next to each other because we were in business. And so he was in 2A and I was in, you know, 2B. And so, fuck. We're on the same flight and he's sitting next to me. So I'm on a one hour flight with Steve Lukather. Yeah. Think about all the things that I could have asked him. Yeah. Okay, I, I, how did you play with Michael Jackson? Well, how was the process? Well, how did you come up with that riff? All these questions about Toto, you know, hundreds of 
we were on the plane for one hour. We just talked about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> we didn't mention music once or guitars. What strings do you use? What kind of pickups do you use? What amp? None of that. But I remember when we landed, so we're getting ready to, you know, get off the plane. I, I said to Luke, you know, there's so many things I want to talk to you about, about music. And he said, yeah, same with you, about Stingman. And then right at the very end, he's like, so what was the, what's your favorite album that you did with Sting? You know, I went, well, um, to 10 Sumner's Tales, probably. And he went, and, and I asked him about, yeah, I wanted to know about Michael. And then we had to get off the plane and we went off our, that's the last time I saw him. Right. So we never got the chat that I wanted to have with him. Yeah. But my point is, is that we, you learn from much more from people by not going directly to the source. Yeah. And with Ke Kenny is a perfect example of this. I learned about his lifestyle, his lifestyle and his uh, his outlook on life, his who he was as a human, who he what he was to Sting. That taught me more about how to approach Sting's music than sitting down and understanding voicings. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Does that sound yeah. a bit too out there? No, it doesn't, actually, because I tell you what, you got me thinking about Matheny just from your approach and the sonics of that and the tone of your album. I was thinking about Matheny. I'm thinking Matheny never really, I've never heard him talk specifics. And I was, when you're trying to figure out what the hell he's doing, which is pretty complicated, it's quite frustrating that you, he never really gives you the juice on it. But I suppose. It is exactly that. He is one of those gurus, and he's teaching by what he does, you know. Um, yeah, it's just it, it, that's not the point of it. Because, so you know, when it comes down to the that. details, when it comes down to the details, we're, we all speak the language of music. You mm. do, I do, and anyone worth, you know, who's in this game, mm. we can figure out who's doing what. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you put your mind to it, yeah. okay, all right, I see what, what's happening here. You know, the sort of put your Rick Beato head on and you can understand what's going on here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's absolutely. why I think he's a very good teacher because he he teaches you how to figure things out. Yeah. And uh, that's it's everybody's responsibility. Every music student should really they, they shouldn't ask. Nobody should tell them how to do it. you got to sort it out, mate. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but, but we can teach you other stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah about how to play in a band and how to just how to learn yeah but it's i'm much more interested in in how kenny kirkland or luke or all these people how or pat metheny what was his experience with uh, Joni mitchell you know it's like there's so many things i'd like to know but he must have learned a lot from that and then he was playing there with jacko who apparently pissed everybody off because he was like a, a certain period in his in his career where he just couldn't stop shredding or whatever uh, and he pissed off a Brecker and but still they had that experience you know what i mean yeah. but they ended up playing in in this way because of a type of lifestyle yeah right. and it's our responsibility as musicians to figure out if we want to know why they chose the notes that they chose we can figure out what they played yeah but it's it's the the choices that they make is it's a much deeper study yeah you know we don't know really what life they've led unless yeah. we talk to them yeah. But that's really where it comes from. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And all the people who played on Asia, for instance, all those great musicians, which is probably the masterclass of session playing mm. for anybody. It's yeah. like, what is it to be a session player or an arranger? Yeah. yeah. You know? It's so brilliant. But it's pointless trying to really kind of uh, talk to these guys about the harmonic choices yeah because you know what they are you can hear it that's right that's yeah. what ear training is that's right yeah yeah but cool. it's like how did they get there this is what i'm interested in yeah yeah you know it's, it's like what life are they leading what you know it's like what are they eating for instance or what what do they watch on telly yeah interesting i mean that's what i'm interested in the other name I was going to mention would be Branford Marsalis. So I saw that, that sort oh, of playing on the last Sting record. But I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the answer just gave applies to that too. I mean, I just, what a great blend, you, all of you guys together. And he's, 
I, I, I mean, it's really weird because I, I love Bradford's his his day job is as a leading oh. jazz musician. I love that metric stuff. His band do. I mean, he's so schooled. It's, but what an amazing yeah. um, statement he makes when he plays a solo with you guys. It's killing. Yeah. It's just yeah, it's it, killing. again, it's that trust that, that I think is a big part of. It's definitely a big part of what you talked about here. But it's, it's it's faith and trust, and he's there's no 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 shred of anything that would tend to indicate that he needs to justify his harmonic knowledge or his command of the saxophone. You're talking about ego. It's there's just no there's ego. none of that. When he he turns up and plays a solo with, on a sting rug, it's just so beautiful. It's just yeah. Wow. I totally agree. You know, Branford and Kenny are, because before I came into the band, they were kind of running the show. Right. And, uh, you know, when Kenny died, it was pretty much like the, the whole, that part of Sting's career died as well. And I felt a huge responsibility to Kenny. So every time I'm doing anything, I'm thinking about what, what would Kenny do? Right. I'm always thinking about his voicings all the time. Yeah. How would Kenny approach this? Because this is the, the dialect that we speak in. And what Branford, every time that Branford comes in the room, I know something good is going to happen. You know, it's like when someone, you know, on a personal level, you know, you know that when so-and-so is in the room, that the, the room will have an, a different type of light. Mm. Mm. And he always brings light to the room. And and warmth and and intelligence and uh, humor and all the v virtues that you'd want and that transcends into actual music. Yeah, because he's the only saxophone player I've ever heard who makes it sound more like a woodwind instrument. You know, I've, it's such a pure tone. It's kind of it's uh it's creamy sort of tone because I'm not you know I'm not a huge sax guy fan i like stan gets right. you know or you know that's my more my kind of thing i'm not you know, heavily in that's not my sort of go-to sound i like woodwinds right. you know but branford when i hear branford play the sax oh my god and as you say it's the when when he plays a solo everything just sounds majestic i mean kenny kirkland when he played a solo he ne it was always different obviously but I remember when we did an album, uh, Mercury Falling, he did the solo on a, on a song called La Belle Dame Sans Regret, which I think a lot of people study that solo. It's been transcribed by many people. I was in the studio when he did that. That was one take. Yeah, I, I swear to God, I, and Sting and I, at the end of that, we were in the control room with Hugh Badger. We were like, did that really happen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just a piece of perfection. Yeah. It's it's musical genius. It's you know, it's a, it's a chord sequence. It's not a genius chord sequence, but he turned it into something ink. Have a listen to that solo. I yeah. urge you. I wonder, yeah. Yeah. La Belle Dame. Yeah. It's a rare track. It's where he's singing in French. Right. And um the solo on that that song was first take. Wow. And people in Berkeley have been trying to figure it out for years and yeah. what, what what he's doing and it's 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 amazing. So I'm glad that you mentioned uh Kenny. Oh and that's, Bradford. That's so I don't know if you know Michael Brecker's first album. There's a great minor blues thing called Nothing Personal and Kenny Kirkman takes a solo on that. It's like, oh man, that's one of the best pianos of all the yeah. all time. It's just so beautiful. But um, can I ask you one more thing? Yeah. Quick question. So to your recollection, um the Ten Summoners Tales album was that um, in any way a more uh, protracted process than any of the records? What sort of time scale were you talking? About, would we be talking about from start to record to finishing the recording of that album? The way that ha album happened is it was after the uh, Soul Cages tour. Yeah, we the, we built a really good chemistry after that that tour. That we we had a, an identity as a sound because mm. that was Vinny. David Sanctus, uh, Sting, and myself. Yeah. So Sting just wanted to hang out with me and just to do some demoing and fun and just have. So Sting and I, it was just him and I and uh, an engineer. 
went to Lake House in um, Wiltshire right. for the period of about, I would say, two months. Right. Where I would come one or two days a week and the rest of the time he was on his own. Right. And we put together some demos, you know, really rough, you know, on drum machine, kind of uh, both of us playing keyboards badly, you know, and uh, pseudo. Uh, those were the days when he had the Synclavier, so everything sounded good because we had the Synclavier, this monstrosity of a of a rig, but yeah. which is all on a, you can get on a Nord now or yeah. on a laptop or yeah. on your phone. Yeah, yeah. So then what happened is every, then everybody came in in the summer of, I think it was 93. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty certain it was 93. They, we sh shipped everyone in, uh, Vinny and David showed up. Yeah. And then in the space of uh, two and a half or three weeks, we just played all those songs in the same room. So even the desk was in the same room. Right. So Hugh Padgham had the SSL desk in a huge dining room in Sting's house. So we had the drums in the control room, vocals in the, you know, kind of pseudo booths that we made up. There's a few videos where you can sort of see us doing that. It really was like that. Yeah. So there's spill and bleed everywhere. And so we, we just laid down the foundations of all those tunes, just like boom, boom, boom. You know, as soon as we had Vinny, it was like, oh, my God. You know, he totally understood what to do. It was just like, a, and David with his incredible majestic chords, because he he has that sort of majesty about the way he articulates chords. And he's the only real keyboard player who I've known who's put so much care into, into sound. And he was way ahead of his time with technology. You know, he was always on the latest thing. And he really knew how to, how to uh, make sounds, you know, mm. He could get a good sound out of a DX7. Wow, that's not cheap. Not that we had a DX7, but if, if anyone could, he could. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Wow. Yeah. He's a sound guy. So yeah. part of that panoramic sound is David. Yeah. And so it was a it was a really happy time, a very, very happy time, because we were celebrating the chemistry that we'd created over a two almost a two-year tour on the Soul wow. Cages tour, right. which went on forever. But we used to jam a lot on that tour, so we created a kind of chemistry, yeah. and the the fruit the fruits of all those labors and all those year those months and months on on tour are ten summoners tales. Yeah, and uh, some of the elements of the demos are still on the record. You know, it's it's quite interesting actually. Mm. A song like "Heavy Cloud, No Rain," with I programmed a drum machine on that. When I was programming the hi hat, I didn't understand the uh, the looping process of. Uh, I made a mistake with the hi hat, right? And I looped it to twelve bars or something, or sixteen, in, instead of, you know, eighteen, or it wasn't a square amount. So there's a there's a, a missing amount of hi hat beats, right? And that's on the record. So suddenly the hi hat drops out. Wow. And I'm using this timbale kind of sound as a snare. And then Vic, Sting liked it. And I'm going, Sting, we go, let's just cut and paste. This is the, actually the days before cut and paste, but there were other ways of cutting and pasting in those days where you just copy it. And, uh, you know, I don't know what Hugh Pajam used to do, but Sting likes it. He yeah. liked that mistake, the yeah. way it dropped out. Have a listen to that song. Yeah. And it's just these little accidents that happened. And uh, it was fun. And I remember on that, there was a, it was a really good time when we brought in a few session players, a harmonica player and uh, yeah. some string players. And, and uh, Guy Barker did some trumpet. And I remember when Sting and I wrote the cello part for uh, Shape of My Heart. Of course, you know, we both wrote it out on some manuscript paper and it was laden with mistakes, you know, <laughs> the, the sharps and flats weren't there. It was all wrong and, you know, the poor uh, cello players uh, well, were music students, I think. They came in and it's like right, with their pencils, ev almost every note was wrong because <laughs> I didn't put natural where it should be a flat or a key signature. It's like it was so funny. But we had such a great time. That was a, one of the highlights of my career with Sting was, was making that album. 
really good time. And it was done pretty fast once the musicians were there. Yeah. So I would say it was about a month and a half, nearly two months of writing under only three, three weeks of band in the, in the lake house. Amazing. We all lived in the house. Yeah. We were there permanently. And, um, and then we, we, we mixed it, you know, yeah. um, Hugh Padgham mixed it, a great engineer. I remember a few people came down while we were doing the record. Elton John came down, um, uh, Pavarotti came down because we did a song with Pavarotti, you know, because things always got like uh, interesting friends coming over yeah. and he would play them some of these songs. And I remember Elton just going, listening to Fields of Gold and just going, wow, what a great song, you know, and uh, it's amazing, you know, to see these people coming and going. I mean, it's one of the amazing things about working with Stink for so long is I've met so many amazing musicians and they're they're all incredible people and I can see why they're successful. Yeah. It's absolutely. because they're first of all they're they're brilliant at what they do. And secondly, they're chilled and they're nice. Yeah. They're easy to hang out with. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this this is very kind of you to take the time to do this. Um let's do a force ending. So thanks for your time, Dominic. And if anybody's watching, please check out Dominic's solo CDs. They are absolutely beautiful. And they're, they're the kind of thing you're going to want to play time and time again. I love that album, Absinthe, as well. Is it called a Bandoneon? I don't know. Yeah, Bandoneon. Oh, yeah. Matt, it's, it's, that, that album's killing, too. But anyway, thanks for listening, guys. And uh, keep looking out for the next content. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. Dominic Miller